off your phones and everything. Turn off your computers. Well, turned off your phones. Okay, let me welcome everybody to Hudson. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to hear talk about a, a critical and actually fascinating issue with the impact of new social media, revolutionary changes in, in information processing and access to, inf and, uh, access to sources, um, the challenges and the opportunities this presents. Uh, could everybody make sure to turn off or turn your uh, on your your communication your own communication devices on a silent mode? Um, this is the uh, latest in our series of public discussions uh, that is a part of our project. We're doing comp thanks to the John D and Catherine T MacArthur Foundation, which is supporting our dialogues on nuclear security and nonproliferation. Uh, and, and of course, this topic covers both of those. Uh, and we're also, I think we also benefit from the fact that MacArthur funded the report we're going to talk about today, which is the Nuclear Monitoring and Verification of Digital Age Report, seven recommendations for improving the process, but I found many more than seven, so we can go into those. Um, this, is a con this report was done by the Nuclear Verification Capabilities Independent Task Force of the Federation of American Scientists. Um, the three speakers are speaking in their personal capacity today. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Chris Bidwell. He is a senior fellow in nonproliferation policy and law uh, at the Federation of American Scientists and a longtime colleague. Uh, we've worked together in decades uh, in, in, this, in this area. Um, then uh, John Lauder is a senior advisor for the James Garfield Institute of Public Leadership, which helps promote uh, public uh, service commitments, as, as we do here at Hudson, by young people uh, and others based in Ohio. He's also a 33-year veteran of the intelligence community and has been very deeply in involved in these issues for decades now. And then uh, Harji Rishikoff, who is the chair of the Advisory Committee of the American Bar Association, uh, Standing Committee in Law and National Security, also involved in an uh, NBA national task force for cyber and the law issues, and also a longtime colleague, more importantly, a former teacher of mine back at, at Harvard when he was a graduate student and I was an undergraduate. Um, so what they'll do is we'll make presentations. With, uh, uh, Chris will be the longest, and there'll be a couple short ones. Then I'll, uh, we'll go to questions and, and, and comments. And you're free to make comments. You don't need to ask a question. I'll ask a, a, raise a few of my own, and then we'll go back and forth to the audience. Uh, since, since we are in the digital age, we have the advantage that we can uh, communicate, let people watch the event live stream in real time, as well as later on the uh, website. But it also means that people who are watching a live stream want to communicate with me, just uh, make a question or a comment to the panel, just write to me, and, and that's at W-E-I-T-Z, my last name, whites at Hudson, like the river, dot org, O-R-G, and I'll try and uh, address the comments as the event goes on. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, I know we're talking today about nuclear monitoring and verification in the digital age, and one of the characteristics of the digital age was outlined by Carl Stoiber, who's out in the audience who uh, always does these caricatures, and noted that yesterday the atomic clock has now moved two minutes to midnight, closer than it's been in, in decades. So uh, this makes this uh, presentation we're giving rather timely in Chris's humble opinion. Uh, Richard, Richard, you stole some of my lines, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not mad. Uh, Richard introduced myself, Harvey, and John, but there are some other very important members of the task force, uh, the independent task force that contributed to this. And then one was Dr. Charles Ferguson, who was a former president of Federation of American Scientists and has recently moved over to the National Academy of Sciences. And others who contributed some, some very significant research papers included FAS associate researcher Pia Ulrich, uh, as well as Valerie Lindsay of the Wisconsin Project, and Jeffrey Lewis and Melissa Hanham of the Middlebury uh, Center for Nonproliferation Studies in Monterey. Uh, I, too, would like to thank the uh, MacArthur Foundation uh, for funding and support for this, uh, as well as our previous two task force reports. And I'd especially like to thank Richard for inviting us here to speak today to discuss our work. So what is our work? What is it all about? What are we doing here? Well, back in 2014, us uh, three amigos got together and uh, st started to look at the status of monitoring and verification 
in light of the discussion that was beginning to take place with regards to Iran's nuclear program. There was talk that a deal might be coming. And we said, well, if there is a deal, what would the monitoring and verification requirements be? And we delivered our first report, which I call the Red Report, and made a number of recommendations. And some of those recommendations were very important. One was for the establishment, if the agreement took place, is that the establishment of a joint consultative commission be established, which is a standard in many arms control agreements. And the idea of the joint consultative commission is to work through problems at a lower political level so they don't become big problems, try to deal with discrepancies, with claims back and forth. And that tends to be very helpful for the process because if everything gets elevated at the high political level, things tend to grind to a halt with regards to any agreement one might have. We also had recommended the establishment of a procurement channel for dual-use goods, the idea being if dual-use goods found their way into Iran and they weren't declared ahead of time, that that would be a per se violation. Also in that report, probably our most salient recommendation was the reestablishment or re-energizing of the arms control observer group. And this was back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You had in the Senate the arms control observer group, which was sitting senators, and it wasn't really necessarily the backbenchers, that would travel with the delegations and actually help with the negotiations on some of the big Russia treaties that took place in the 70s and 80s. And the importance was that these senators could go back and tell their fellow senators what the deal was all about and how they tried to allay various concerns on the Republican side or the Democratic side. The remarkable thing about that is the votes that would come out on these treaties, 94 to 6, 92 to 8, very broad bipartisan support because the work was done up front to get everybody on board. I don't think that is the way it necessarily went down with regards to the Iran agreement, and that may have been a tactical problem that may be resolved, maybe not, I don't know. We also had recommended maintenance of the sanctions architecture so that if there was a snapback, you had law to snap back to. Our second report, what I colloquially call the blue report, we came out in 2015, shortly after the deal was announced, and we said, well, we made recommendations of requirements for monitoring and verification. Now we want to make some recommendations with regards to implementing the monitoring and verification processes that were included in the JCPOA. We argued very eloquently, I thought, that the United States government have a belly button for implementation, either at the NSC or at the State Department, just as long as there was a true belly button who was coordinating amongst the many agencies that had a piece of responsibility within the JCPOA. Ambassador Mull was eventually appointed to fill that role. We also recommended the U.S. continue to support the IAEA monitoring mission because the IAEA is using a number of their resources, a big percentage of their resources, on the Iran program. What does that mean? Well, we want better verification. It takes more people, more resources. But also, if you're spending all your time and your whole staff's focused on Iran, they're not focused on the other 194 countries out there. And the final recommendation is we talked about exploitation of open source monitoring capabilities. That became the precursor, if you will, to our third and final report, which we're talking about today, nuclear monitoring and verification in the digital age. So we took on the ambitious task of trying to define what's different in the digital age, and we focused on four phenomena. The first being the explosion in commercially available overhead imagery and monitoring capability. There's more and more of it. It's cheaper and cheaper. It continues to get cheaper and cheaper and continues to proliferate to this very day. Issue one. Issue two. The availability and access of commercial transaction data, the ease at which one can pull down documents, trade-related documents, that 20 years ago was not possible. I have experience as a young associate lawyer in a firm, and when I wanted to pull down a government document, I might spend a week, two weeks, and in one case four weeks, in jeans and T-shirts, flipping through finger over finger, file over file, looking for the evidence I was seeking. Now I could probably sit at my desk, run a couple algorithms, and pull up most of what I'm looking for in an hour's worth of time. Added to those two factors, you have the issues of mechanical learning and AI. 
machine learning uh, and AI, excuse me. And the idea that if I'm looking for pictures of sites, I don't have to hand look at every picture and see what matches. The algorithm is starting to force data into me so I can make a, make a case, make, make a, establish a, what, what I think I know faster and faster than before. So you take all of this and you dump it onto the, to the, the, new, uh, the new media that we live in, the new media world we live in in the last uh, seven, eight years. Uh, the impact is that you've got a media megaphone, both social media and traditional outlets, that allow anybody, and that means some bloke off the street like Chris Bidwell, to comment on the, you know, whether the Iran, Iranians or any other party uh, is, is cheating on their nonproliferation treaty obligations. Um, I think this creates a, a problems and issues for the, for the government community, for the policy community, but uh, we're here to stay. And, and, and using what I described above and what Chris Stubbs of, of Harvard and Sid Drell of Stanford in a paper they wrote a couple of years ago described as these public technical means. And these public technical means, you know, more overhead imagery, uh, easier access to, to transaction data, allow NGOs to have a bigger role, NGOs like ourselves, Federation of American Science, to have a bigger role in the uh, in the proliferate in the in the debates, so the three audiences for our report were the NGOs themselves, the NGO enablers, and governments. I wanted to highlight uh, something about a visit we took uh, as part of this project to a place called Planet Lab. I don't know if any of you have ever been there before, but uh, Planet Lab is putting up satellites, uh, Dove satellites, my micro satellites. They're called a number of different things. Uh, we visited this warehouse, and it was a pr pretty typical Silicon Valley startup. Those of us of a certain age, and there's many of us in this room, think of uh, a company manufacturing satellites as clean rooms and men and women in white coats, uh, you know, walking around big, big projects. This was, uh, you know, a table, a couple of guys assembling, uh, a couple of guys and, and, and girls assembling uh, satellites and getting them off FedEx to, to India so they could be on the next rocket launch. And shortly before they were, we went there, a couple weeks before we went there, they were getting ready to launch another 88 satellites into orbit. Um, the other uh, the other company we uh, we examined was Black Sky, um, who in 2019 promises you know for ninety dollars in 90 minutes you can get a photo of any place in the world at 0.9 meter resolution. And what's most important about this is not that you're going to get a cool picture, is that it's going to be merged with geolocation data and other sources. This is growing faster and faster and is only going to take the phenomenon I'm trying to describe, uh, speed it up even, even, even more so. Um, and trade data, number of numerous resources. You can read the report that uh, where, uh, where trade data can be, can be gathered. It, too, more of it, faster processing times, and cheaper. Um, I wanted uh, I wanted to expand a little bit uh, too on the uh, on the on the media aspect of this, both traditional and social. More people are getting their news, including news about proliferation violations, from their social media networks. But this does not mean that we're all on the same non-pro narrative. Um, let me ask the audience here: How many of you are on LinkedIn? A number. How many of you are on Twitter? How many of you have heard of Twitter? <laughs> okay, a little more. Um, Instagram, a little less. How many of you are on Tencent? Tencent is a social media platform larger than all three of those combined. It's based out of China. And Tencent is running, uh, and then if you go over to Russia, VK, both running social media narratives, kind of separate from the social media narratives we go through. And I think it's very important to, to realize that not, not everybody is on the same, what I would call US-centric or, or European-centric pages. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that came as quite a shock to me, to, 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 to be honest. Um, so how does, this, how does this work in practice? I want to give you two examples. Um, back the, on the day uh, uh, that uh, Kerry was testifying about three, four weeks before the establishment of the JCPOA, Kerry was asked to test, uh, Secretary Kerry was asked to testify, it was asked to testify uh, as, as to, uh, you know, how the JCPOA was working and, and you know, was it going to be a good deal. That same morning, uh, a organization uh, uh, held a press conference in the press club in Washington, D.C., and basically said, we found a new site, Lazavan 3, 
And we've got all these great pictures and data showing what's going on at Lozovan 3. And this was the National Council for the Iranian Resistance. I think I've got that right. I might have a word transposed there. Anyway, the, the National Council said, look at this. This is a big problem. Well, two hours later, poor Secretary Kerry is getting ready to, is sitting up there testifying for Congress, and he's getting peppered with questions about this new Lozovan 3 site. Well, a few days later, many, uh, many bloggers and, and, and other non-pro people started taking apart the story and realized, well, this is actually a Czech manufacturing facility and is not a, a part of a, a nuclear centrifuge facility as claimed. However, the damage was already done. Kerry was being, getting beat up about you know, sites that, 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 he, that he didn't know about. And uh, you know, six months later, I read some testimony from some, uh, some senator still bringing the issue of Lazavan 3 up. The old adage that uh, the, the truth gets halfway around the or the, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its pants on really plays out in, in, in that scenario. So I will. Uh, I'm going over time here. So um, I wanted to. Uh, well, I think uh, Richard's going to bring up some questions. So I will stop there. And I thank you all for your time and attention. I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Uh, just uh, uh, make clear these reports are available on your website, right? These reports are available on the FAS.org website. Right. And actually, in addition to the main report, the papers related to the report can also be accessed through the website. Let me, um, let me add my uh, thanks for the invitation to be here with you today. Uh, and for your interest in attending, had a chance before we started to spend a little time with um, uh, some of the um, the interns that are here, some of the um, the student affiliates of the of the institute. And one of the reasons that I'm really grateful to be here at Hudson today is that when I was a graduate student at Yale, I clearly couldn't get into Harvard. Um, I, my very first public presentation on nuclear matters was at the old Hudson Institute in 1973. I was invited to come down and be part of a, of a panel with a few of my uh, professors when we were talking about some of the changes that were underway in nuclear targeting at the time. So it, we've come a long way since, uh, and, um, and I, I have much less hair now and, and more girth than I did then, but it's nice to be back uh, here at, um, at Hudson. Uh, Chris described how our task force assessed the growing capabilities of non-governmental organizations related to monitoring and verification. And I guess as a former government person, I should note that as significant as those growing capabilities are, they do not diminish the primacy of governments in monitoring and more importantly, in making verification and compliance determinations, which really can only be performed by governments. Governments have a far greater capacity to discover and penetrate nuclear weapons programs of concern. And the capacity of the U.S. and other governments rests largely on intelligence sources and methods, as well as on negotiated inspection, information sharing, and confidence building measures. In this context, let me just say a few words about what we mean by monitoring and verification, because it'll come up, I think, in our discussion at several points. In our study, we note the distinction between the terms monitoring and verification and use definitions that are, that are most widely accepted and used within the governmental monitoring and verification communities, but whose distinctions are sometimes lost in public debate. Monitoring is the gathering of information relevant to compliance assessments through intelligence means, including the undefined national technical means that are frequently cited in arms control and nonproliferation agreements, a diplomatic means and negotiating measures. Verification is the process of reaching political judgments about that information, especially as it relates to the extent and significance of compliance and the determination of how to resolve ambiguities or evidence of non-compliance. Governments are well positioned to encourage and facilitate the work of international organizations and NGOs to participate in both the monitoring process 
um, and to attest to the credibility of verification judgments. In this regard, however, one of the findings of our study was that the implementation of the Iran Agreement has actually made it harder for NGOs, other observers, and governments outside those that negotiated the agreement, the P5 plus 1 in Iran, it made it harder for those bodies to contribute to the monitoring process and for making judgments about the effectiveness of the agreement. The Iranian government apparently has, has strongly argued for confidentiality of nearly every aspect of implementation, and the P5 plus 1 and the IEA are reportedly receiving information that's relevant to their monitoring and compliance and agreeing to hold that information uh, confidential uh, as, a, as a carrot to, to grant Iran in the negotiation. Still, the lack of transparency and sparse authoritative official reporting on the implementation of the agreement has created an environment in which suspicions, uh, fake news, and unfounded accusations can flourish along the lines that Chris has already mentioned. And this complicates the ability of both proponents and opponents of the agreement for making their case in public political fora in which verification judgments are made. So our task force offered several findings and recommendations to bring about greater transparency and to build greater confidence in implementation of the nuclear agreement and other similar nuclear agreements. Let me just mention two of those in the interest of time. Uh, first, an important benefit of the Iranian nuclear agreement was that it could be a step toward greater openness in Iran's military and nuclear energy programs, in its politics, and its relationship with the rest of the world. I testified on the, in advance of the JCPOA on the Hill, and I used the phrase, which I think Harvey had given me, about the need to bring Iran into a culture of compliance. And there were a few sighs by some of the members on the committee that maybe I had overstated the case. But the, the idea of using arms control and non-proliferation agreements to facilitate openness, to facilitate greater communication, uh, is well known and, and well uh, practiced. Uh, and one consequence of the lack of Iranian transparency and openness is that it in, in, impinges on this process of greater openness. It actually impinges uh, because it doesn't create a, a foster a, um, uh, an attractive business environment uh, for international firms. It impinges on the very economic benefits that Iran sought in the nuclear agreement. So address, to address this lack of transparency, our task force recommended that there should be a priority diplomatic push by members of the P5 plus one and other interesting states supported by the international business community toward encouraging greater Iranian openness and more public release of, of data from the IAEA and from the P5 plus one. In addition, the lack of transparency has caused some to question whether the agreement is being fully complied with by Iran. Partisan discord within the United States and diplomatic disagreements between the U.S. and other states about the wisdom of the agreement have worked against the shared consensus about the utility of the agreement. Um, some critics of the accord believe that the P5 plus one are insufficiently attentive to monitoring or not serious about pressing for compliance. Even proponents of the agreement worry about Iranian ability to deny and deceive the efforts of monitors and the overall commitment of the Iranian regime to its international promises and assurances. Now, I'm confident that the classified monitoring community is working hard and professionally, but there's not always a shared understanding of that important work. Previous arms control agreements have mitigated such concern by creating trusted bodies of outside experts to review monitoring efforts at a classified level. And such bodies have built confidence, even among skeptics, that serious and appropriate monitoring steps are being taken. And our task force accordingly recommended that a team of outside experts, insulated as much as possible from political pressures, should be created for the Iranian nuclear agreement and conceivably for a, a new Korean agreement and others. And such a team could take one of two forms. One approach could be to form an independent advisory group of experts to review monitoring efforts at a uh, classified level. 
and that team, if possible, should issue periodic unclassified summaries of its judgments. Another approach, and Chris alluded to this earlier, would be to revitalize the congressional oversight process, either through existing committees, through the renewed uh, Arms Control Observer Group that Chris uh, mentioned, or to for, for the creation of a joint congressional commission with appropriate bipartisan representation and sufficient expert staff cleared to an appropriate level. Now, as a former governor, a government practitioner of monitoring, I, I tend to emphasize those steps, those steps that the U.S. government itself should take. But as I noted earlier, verification judgments take place within a broader public and political context. And hence, our study suggests some measures to promote more accurate and reliable discussion of information relevant to compliance judgments. And Harvey Rishikoff will outline some of our findings and recommendations. Great. Thank you. Um, well, first, Richard, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here because uh, there's nothing greater for a tutor to see a student surpass the tutor. So to see someone who was interested in policy issues as a young man to come to where you are today at Hudson is, is quite gratifying, and they're, they're lucky to have you. Thanks. But uh, a bit of an exaggeration, but we'll let go. But remember, Friday I, morning, I'm going to go I, I still take... Uh, <laughs> I still have to take um, lie detector tests, so it has to be true, right? I still have polygraph. <laughs> um, and it's good to have someone from Yale because I believe they're still accredited. It's always unclear to me where they are in that we process have. when you were there, John. Well, we're a football pilot. Yeah, a football pilot. <laughs> uh, so I think one of the issues we have is we've run these three reports starting in uh, 2014. And we are now, I think, increasingly experiencing a tipping point. And we're at a tipping point because of a variety of trends that are coming together that our interests have um, focused on. And the first is the, the general trend. There's a new RAND report out called um, Truth Decay, that we are in a situation in which there are four increasing trends that are making it hard for public policy debates. And the first is the increasing disagreement about facts and analytical interpretation of facts and data. When I was in graduate school, uh, there was a man named Emmanuel Wallerstein who gave a course for us called Evidence and Inference. And we began to see increasingly the fight over what evidence was and then inference. So how many people in this room can write an algorithm? So these are the dangerous people who are <laughs> on the sides here because we're increasingly using these algorithms in order to us to have you bang data and then have inferences come from that data. And the algorithm writers are becoming the true interpreters of how we begin to understand how we interpret facts and what appear to be facts. The second aspect was the blurring of the line between opinion and fact. Uh, we used to always, I always say that um, if you know as a factual matter that the glass is half full, it's a question of opinion as whether that's positive or negative. And that until you operationalize the fact in the context of an argument, the fact itself is meaningless. And then the third trend is um, the increase in volume and the increase of the amount of sources we have and the discrediting of sources that we, used, that we all grew up with. So the older generation in the room are having a real cohort issues. Because in our generation, we watched CBS News and Walter Cronkite. And if Walter Cronkite said something, it was dramatic. And when Cronkite in our generation made it clear that he believed we were not winning in Vietnam and stated that on national TV, that was a traumatizing moment for the shared American policy audience. We have no equivalent today of a news source that has that power of legitimacy in public debate. And what's happening is that people are listening to their own feeds, 
their own opinions, and we've created a notion of an echo chamber for information in different circles. And there's um, a declining trust in what factual information is. So what happened is, was we were focusing on verification and monitoring, and as John pointed out, the monitoring issue we believe historically was more of a scientific element of the debate, that something would be shown if there had been some form of violation of the agreement. But we all could agree that that had taken place as a scientific fact. Then the issue of the verification would be what would be the political response to that fact. So when we started the process, one of the issues was, if you remember, during Iraq 1, the issue was, what was a breach? How did we know the agreement had been breached? And we, and on the group, found there were two schools of thought. One school of thought very much wanted, a, what I would say as a lawyer, a clear definition of the breach. That if we found X, that per se was a breach that vitiated the contract. That's how we normally do it in the private sector. And there was a group of congressmen and congresspeople that wanted that level of clarity. But then there was another group that did not want that level of clarity because they wanted to have a level of ambiguity because the theory would be if there was a breach per se, the natural argument would be what is the remedy? What are you going to do about it? And some political officials wanted it to be self-effectuating. Breach takes place, agreement broken, we then have alternative means in order of us to resolve that issue. Other pieces of the Congress said, we don't want that because that will imply that we have no choice. That if we don't do something in other means, we are failing in our responsibilities. So that becomes a very fascinating aspect of the context. So what we started arguing for was what we call in our report a, a network of centers of non-proliferation non authentication, which meant that we're using it for the proliferation issue, but you could use almost any public policy debate and plug in what we see these centers to be. And the centers would have an arm's length relationship with the government. And the reason that is is because there's an increasing distrust of government putting forward information as being accurate. It's an unfortunate phenomena, but I think increasingly individuals around the world, regardless of what the government entity is, does, do not see them as centers of authority of trust. The second issue we want to have the characteristics is that it should be in an academic institution. And the reason we want it in an academic institution is because academics I've never really gotten the memo that the point of life is to accumulate large sums of money. Uh, what uh, academics are particularly concerned about is their reputation. So if you're an academic, you want to be known as the person who has explained that everyone prior to you was wrong and that your book is the right answer. And your reputation stands on that ability for you to give insight into facts and issues that people have not seen before. So the theory would be you want an academic institution because if they say, if an academic says X and it proves to be wrong, their opinion and their reputation will be severely damaged. I don't know if you remember years ago, there was the famous German historian uh, Roper at Oxford who they presented him with a series of diaries that were supposedly Hitler's diaries. And they were again you know, auctioned the diaries for an extraordinary sum of money. And because this Oxford historian, German historian, said they were authentic, it helped drive the market price. And when they proved to be not authentic, his, he, he retreated from public policy and debate because of the embarrassment that might have been invested on him. That's one of the reasons that you want academics in it. The third is that as much as possible, do not have advocacy as the core that there's supposed to be an element the way we always understood science and academic community, rather than being advocates for a position, that they would put forward the, the, the issue.
And then we talk about sources and methods have to be transparent. It has to be documented. Um, and that um, we have to have them tied to the news cycle. So if you notice, both Google and uh, the other social media are increasingly having a problem with the issues that are placed on their platform and the consequences of the effects of that platform. So one of the issues that uh, a man named Dan Gear, who I recommend you to Google, and there's a number of TED Talks, um, and Gear is sort of one of the old uh, geezers of the cyber world, has argued that in the future, the core issue for us is going to be authenticity. We are reaching a stage in informations in zero and ones that the manipulation of a photograph is increasingly becoming difficult to use forensics to make it clear that that photograph actually has been doctored. And sit back and think what that means. That the ability to not have authenticity for information would really cause an extraordinary revolution in our ability to understand what truth is. Which is why I think the distributed ledger, ledger what well, you know is Bitcoin, is becoming an extraordinary phenomena because of the ledger. How many of you, by the way, own Bitcoin, have a Bitcoin? There's two people, I would say under 40, <laughs> and everyone else can raise their hand. When I ask that question in Silicon Valley, every hand goes up. I actually, about two years ago, was giving a talk, and a young man came up to me, and I said, when he raised his hand, he said, oh, I've invested every penny I have in Bitcoin. I said, are you insane? To which he said, you're over 40, aren't you? I said, yes. Someone earned Bitcoin. Has anybody earned the Bitcoin? What do you mean earned? What do you mean as opposed to owns? Mine? I, I don't think of any, are you a miner? No, I just read about it enough. <laughs> but to give you that example of the cohort change, but really the concept of the Bitcoin is really a distributed ledger in order to ensure authenticity because of the problems we're encountering in the technological age. And I'll end it with my uh, seven minutes. Why this is particularly important is that um, I don't know many of you have been able to look at the national defense strategy that was just released by Secretary Mattis. But in looking on the modernizing of our capabilities, key capabilities, the first target is our nuclear forces. And that the department will modernize the nuclear triad, including nuclear command and control communications. Modernization of the nuclear force includes developing options to counter competitors' coercive strategies predicated on the threat and use of nuclear or strategic non-nuclear attacks. We are at a tipping point with two entities, the Iranians and the North Koreans. We have been, been able to have a proliferation regime that has not allowed there to be increasing numbers of states with this nuclear capacity. And the new generation that we have for the new interns, if we fail in being able to keep this genie in the bottle, and we have increasing and increasing numbers of nuclear states, nuclear powers, tied to rogue regimes and authoritarian regimes, I put it to you that there's a reason why we, though um, that was began as a joke of how the nuclear hands have moved closer to doomsday. It's a reality that our generation was extremely successful up until the last, I would say, um, decade in keeping the nuclear uh, genie in the bottle. And if we fail, it's unclear to me whether or not what the long-term consequences will be for the world. So with that, I'll stop. Great, great, uh, great conclusion. Thank you very much for your presentations. Just uh, a reference to the, the strategy. Hudson will have at least one event next month, presuming the release date occurs next month, of the Nuclear Posture Review, in which we're going to come back to some of these issues that, that Harvey just mentioned, particularly then the, the non-strategic uh, dimension, of how do you deal with cyber threats and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the questions uh, to the report, I'm going to ask a couple, then we'll go to the audience. Again, if you're watching live stream, feel free to email me a question or comment at whites at hudson.org. What has so far been the, the impact of, of this report, of the three reports? I know, at least on a personal level, I know that when I, we were dealing with one of the 
um, addressing the concerns of the MacArthur Foundation, one of them particularly was this good cyber hygiene, make sure that we, we had good uh, security of our files, we protected our communications, and so on. So I definitely see that are influencing how people are thinking about the, these issues. I wasn't sure what other uh, contributions you yeah. point to. Um, uh, two things that have come out of the reports that are, that are positive developments. Uh, one of the things that we, we hadn't discussed yet was the need to protect providers, bloggers, NGOs uh, that are putting this information out. It turns out when an NGO puts out information about another government, sometimes those governments don't always like what is said about them or likes what is said about what they're doing. And they may respond in ways that are, you know, not uh, constructive. They may respond uh, some, you know, uh, d denial of service attacks on the on the NGOs. A lot of NGOs in this space, uh, I know this anecdotally, have been experiencing uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, some some people go as far as taking, uh, you know, civil civil uh, litigation in London against uh, people that have, have made uh, allegedly false accusations. The the problem is is for the NGOs is when we started doing this work with Federation of American Scientists, for example, was founded 71 years ago, there was no internet. And what we provided in books and, 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 and articles that, that were physically mailed out was our crown jewel. Now our crown jewel is our website. People go to the website to get information. The problem is uh, our website, like many other NGOs, was put together with, well, we got a little funding over here, we got a little funding over here, we got an intern working on this here, and all kind of clues together not with security in mind. And yet now that we're vulnerable to so, such attacks, uh, security becomes a real problem. The fortunate thing is MacArthur and, and the, some of the other funders have recognized this and are now demanding better, high, better uh, cyber hygiene in, uh, from, their, uh, from their fundees uh, and also providing funding to make uh, your, your systems more, more secure. I think that's an important development. That was a, a, a one of our la the last recommendation in this most recent report. The other one we've brought up three times is this uh, revision, uh, revitalization of the Arms Control Observer Group. Uh, there is bipartisan legislation in Congress, uh, H.R. 3810, which uh, cites the FAS report as one of the reasons why that legislation was drafted to recreate uh, not exactly the Arms Control Observer Group, but, but something a little different. Um, one, it's not just the Senate anymore, it's Congress, because, Congress, because the House had such a, an important influence on the sanctions uh, issue. They now are more of a player in the game than, than when we did just treaties, which were required to be ratified by the Senate. So there's there's that legislation which is popping out, and I think those are the two of the more significant. Let, and let me just add uh, uh, a, a point to uh, to that. Uh, one, it, it's always hard to know, and I'm, I'm sure you feel this every day here at Hudson, is how influential you've really been when you've done papers like this and you've done uh, seminars, because ideas ripple through the Washington community and the international community. So it's, it, it, it's difficult to say, well, our task force had an, had an impact. But as, as Chris, uh, Chris noted, uh, two areas where at least the idea gained currency, whether it came from us or it came from others. I would add a third um, that I'm particularly uh, proud of, I guess, having worked in arms control over the years, and that is the role of the consultative commissions that are often established in an arms control or non-proliferation agreement. And we've, you know, U.S., Soviet, U.S., Russian arms control over the years made um, great and effective use of these bodies. Um, and we certainly have in private and public discussions been talking to folks about how to use the joint commission that's established by the JCPOA as a way to resolve some of these questions that have come up related to implementation of the agreement, and also to provide a forum, which other consultative commissions have done in the past, for actually breaking ground on some new ideas, a place that one could begin talking about missiles and not just uh, uh, about uh, uh, nuclear compliance. Not that the agreement itself might embrace that, but it, but at least provides a forum to begin some dialogue that could come to fruition elsewhere. So I would say there was also a, a fourth area, uh, but like many things in Washington, it's always a back and forth, which is that um, we were very conscious of the fact that when we deal with our adversaries, whether it's uh, North Korea or uh, the Iranian deal, which requires 
a period of time for the uh, valuation of the agreement, we had encouraged there being a focal point, an ambassador set, both inside uh, the State Department and inside the intelligence community, that would be individuals who would be permanent members of the bureaucracy to monitor. And uh, there was an ambassador set up at State Department to do that. But in the reorganization that the Secretary of State did, a number of these positions were removed. And we were saying that it might be helpful to have that position reinstated in order for there to be an ongoing commitment institutionally. Because we have elections every four years. Many of our adversaries don't have elections every four years. And if they do have the elections, the same individuals stay in place. So we always are in a bit of a disadvantage with us, us learning the issue anew, as opposed to having a corporate group of individuals who are fully understand the issue and with living the issue. That in particularly happened with our North Korean negotiations over time. Mm. One of the uh, interesting recommendations, and, and Harvey mentioned in his talk, is the setting up this network of centers of non-proliferation authentication. Um, and, and you mentioned why you saw some advantages in the university yeah. and so on. That's going to require a substantial amount of funding and, and a long-term sustained funding process. Yes. Um, I wasn't sure if we had any progress on that. And if not, which yes. may, may be the case, uh, what would you consider to be useful interim or, or minimum things right. we could take first and perhaps the prototype and develop and so on? So the first is there is an entity that has been set up that we were using as a model, and that's the, the Monk Institute. I don't know how many of you are familiar. Blackberry. Yes, <laughs> with uh, Ron Diebert's organization. But he brings together geeks and wonks so that you understand an element of an issue, which is the technical side, and then have subject matter experts who are able to put that geek technical side inside a policy context. So he's just received a number of grants and has been recognized by um, Microsoft and Group as being um, something that he's, he's particularly focused on dissent and the role of dissent in authoritarian re uh, regimes and how to maintain and protect that dissent. So. We believe that we, I've, we've reached out to a number of social media and that our sense is that probably to establish an entity of this type and have it funded is somewhere between, let's say, 5 or $10 million per center. Uh, now, when you look at our DOD budgets and um, what Google and Microsoft's revenues are worldwide, that is not a lot of money to entities of that so, and what we're arguing and meeting with these social media groups and saying is, you are really not in the business of authentication. If you notice Google, I mean, uh, uh, Zoom, uh, Facebook has just announced a new approach to how to deal with media information and how their algorithms will privilege information coming from the network of nest of friends versus receiving information from all sorts of entities and bots. Because as you know, what we've discovered is in the election, there were thousands of bots that were generated to generate news. And if you look at Hamilton 68, I encourage you to look at that web page, which traces what is the monitoring of different foreign powers, of willingness to place certain types of news items in the forefront in our public debate. So our argument is, those institutions, those large social media in which setting up six or seven of these centers would not be a financial burden on them, and that they'd be able to have an independent source to be able to have when information came in that they could say to their users, this story has been generated and seems to have extraordinary providence inside the system. We have asked one of the authentication centers centered at Stanford or even Yale, perhaps, uh, or Rhode Island, uh, where we could have it sent as a group and say they've looked at it and let them show you where the story came from and how it was spread through the system in order to get credibility. So there's another um, academic out of Harvard, Gary King, who has done an interesting study. He, The three the researchers took a false story uh, that they generated and placed 
in three different low-level news networks around the United States. And they injected them. And they injected the story, and then they traced how it moved through our ecosystem for information and started becoming a national news story because of the way it works and how it gets posited. I think we need more of a way to look into how that happens and that the social media groups, I think I, I, think I just saw a study that the four major social media for the first time are spending more money in lobbying in Washington. They now reach, I think, a $50 million mark for their recognition of why Washington is significant why this is important. And they, this, they went from zero, right, to in the last number of years, this level of, of fun, which again, when you look at against their earnings, it's not a rather large significant uh, proportion, but it's very important for the ecosystem. So the report has been, been given to a number of those individuals who are concerned about how to maintain authenticity on their, on their platforms. And that's what we're looking at for funding. The other, the other thing about uh, the platforms, the social media platforms, Google and, and Facebook, they have advertisers. And those advertisers don't want to see their advertisements linked too closely to fake stories or obscenity and a number of other things. And so the, there's, a, there's an economic interest on the part of, of the Googles and the Facebooks to, uh, to have authenticity, as, as Harvey says. Two of them seem to be taking a different approach. Google uh, has been announcing, well, we, we think we can get to a better, better algorithm, and a better algorithm will screen out more stuff. Facebook seems to be announcing taking a, a more of an opposite tr track of, pay, of paying 20,000 people to go through and, and look, for, look for things that they, they don't want to see posted. The natural next step is the you know, authentication of, of, of stuff that maybe not, not be seen or, or gross, but just be wrong. And, and having uh, you know, having this capability would be beneficial to, to I think, their, their bottom line. I'll just do a, a footnote, Chris. So one of the issues is there's always the argument that more technology will solve the problem. And the technologists always believe that's always the answer. So the, the, the sort of the paradigm that was fascinating is um, Facebook had an algorithm for child pornography. So they're very good at taking down child pornography postings. And then what happened was there's the iconic picture that you all know of the Vietnam War of the little girl running down the road f with the napalm, which is sort of the quintessential example of a picture of what had happened in Vietnam. So when that picture was posted up by an academic who was putting some argument forward about the issue, their algorithm saw it as child pornography and immediately took it down. So they then contacted Facebook and said, wait a second, this is a political context. And that's why they are saying we need to have humans because the algorithms have certain power, but the humans will have to intervene. So that's where the tension is. But we're saying this is more about the provenance of the information. And you'd want an independent entity to be analyzing the provenance. And finally, we'll do with the Planet Labs. Um, so we have the capability now with Planet Labs, if you want to stop illegal fishing, the Planet Labs could actually cover a trawler leaving almost any port, watch it go into different areas of the sea, have algorithms to be able to do calculations of how low and how high it's riding in the sea as to actually the weight of the fish catch. Just think of how extraordinary that is. So there's a whole new world for NGOs to police. If you are worried about um, an immigration tent community, how big is that community? Well, governments usually have a desire to underestimate the size. But if you're constantly flying over that geographical space, you could actually map the growing of that immigration community, immigrants community that's being put up. So you realize there's a real tension here between the ability for independent private individuals to enter into the public policy debate with information that is will be diametrically opposed to a government's position. And the last one I'll use is during the um, Olympics, the Chinese were very committed to the air quality for the Olympics. So an enterprising group of journalists 
took bicycles with uh, meters, with uh, ability to measure the air quality, and sent them out in like 12 different directions. And then they brought back the data, which is different than the official gut data that the Chinese were saying about the air quality, and put it up. How do you, that's a new source of information, and then you want to make sure it's authentic and accurate, but it can't runs counter to individuals who have a different commitment to what the information they want to put out in order to, to generate what the public policy debate is going to be. Okay, uh, I've got actually a bunch more questions, particularly counterpart the international level, where we add up, we find the IEA and other bodies. Yeah. But I see people in the audience who know a lot more about these issues than I do. So I'm going to go ahead and let me go to the questions and answers and comments. Yes, yeah, so you just raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and you can or cannot, as you choose, give a name and affiliation. Um, I might as well start with one of our colleagues here. I, I'm uh, Steve Buckingham. I do some uh, off-site uh, research for Richard Weitz. Um, I just had a question. Uh, when I think of um, uh, social media and public platforms, uh, I think about sometimes the difference between Wikipedia and uh, Facebook. It seems that with Wikipedia, um, everything that's posted is part of one post on one topic, and on Facebook, everyone has their own post. Um, and so I was just thinking about this uh, network of um, centers for nonproliferation. I was wondering whether part of that could be a Wikipedia-style platform uh, to develop an accurate picture of uh, reality regarding nuclear arms agreements. Um, and just as an analogy, it would maybe create a sort of World War I-esque uh, trench warfare of information, but where hopefully the trenches would eventually align uh, around the truth, similar to Wikipedia. Um, so uh, if you could maybe comment on kind of maybe a Wikipedia-style platform for this. So as a professor, when I was, I never accepted Wikipedia as a citation for a fact, because you do not know the provenance of the page. But what you're saying is, um, how many of you follow particular blogs? So, sir, which blog do you follow and why? Okay, perfect. So, when you take usually what's happening for sources of information, which is your point, you will, there are people on our, what I would call local notables on an issue. So if you're following the Middle East, one of the local notables is, uh, is Juan Coles at Michigan. And he takes Arabic newspapers and translates them. So many of us who like that area, we often go to the Coles page to see what's being said in different communities that we don't get in the regular news feed. And what happens is Coles no longer needs a New York Times or a Washington Post. He has his own platform. But more specifically, his name is associated with that judgment. His name is, so once you can have the individual, the judgment, and the authenticity, which is what these centers would be, because people will be saying, it's gonna be Richard White saying at Hudson, this is my judgment, these are the facts that I use, this is my position. And increasingly as people become knowledgeable and respected, we go to those particular sites. I, be, I, I check maybe 10 or 15 sites on the range of issues I'm interested in, and I want to know how, what X opinions is before when an issue breaks. And that's, we're going almost back to the period of pre-institutions, because we used to look at institutions and organizations to give that authenticity. That's becoming less so. So the center's theory is a version of Wikipedia, but Wikipedia with authentic, uh, authentication, individuals' names, and judgments that they stand by. That's how we see it. Yeah. Just as like, uh, 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 real quick, in other words, too, kind of the difference in monitoring and, and verification landscape in the open source versus the, the more clandestine source is the sources and methods. If you're going to make a case out, 
you better be laying out a lot more sources and method on the open source to get credibility. You better explain how you got to where you got so somebody else can trace it back. That's kind of an anathema to the community some of us grew up in where that was all very highly classified for good reason. So there's a balance there. Yeah, just I can't resist to put a plug in for your blog. The Federation of American Science has a great collection of articles, particularly on the nuclear debate, nuclear funding, related issues. And then Hudson, our program, has a blog as well. It's HTTPS against nuclear terror.wordpress.com, in which some of our young colleagues are writing. We're trying to contribute to this debate. But it's a great opportunity. There's just a matter of putting the energy and effort into it, but it's low cost. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Great. Um, the woman in the back. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Taylor Winkleman, and I would like to ask for your thoughts on an emerging problem that I see with the verification that Dr. Rishikoff was talking about, where uh, Planet Labs and Airbus and many other remote sensing companies will let you analyze open source data, but they have far more sensitive data behind paywalls. So it becomes a question of what do people have access to and who is going to be able to pay for advanced analytics, more sensitive analytics, more sensitive verification tools, and how is that going to affect the landscape going forward of who gets to determine what's happening on the planet? Sorry, I don't ask nice questions. No, he has a good question, and, and it's a very good question. One of the things I'm, re I'm recalling from memory here is a story, and I think I've got it uh, right. Um, they charge Planet Labs model. They like to charge businesses, and you know, people on Wall Street are very interested, for it, for example, on how many cars each day are in Walmart parking lots, so they can kind of guess, you know, what what the outcome is going to be, and they'll probably pay a hefty price to get that information because it's worth it to them. On the other hand. Planet Labs can choose, and I believe does choose, to certain uh, non, uh, certain uh, NGOs to give it a lot at a, at a very reduced rate or a much cheaper rate or even free. So, in in, in our space, uh, you know, I know they supply a lot of information to to uh, Jeff Lewis and and uh, Melissa Hanham and at, uh, at CNS. Um, I don't know the exact contractual relation they have, but I, knowing the budget of CNS, probably they're not paying a lot, so they are getting getting through to, to some raw. But you raise sort of, it's a fundamental philosophical question. And the first question is, there's different modalities of providing information. So the modality of the government is we provide the information. But the modality of the private sector is, we will provide the information where we're going to charge you. And the charging effect also gives its legitimacy. Because if it turns out that they're charging you and it's not an effective product, the market will punish them. So one of the arguments we're making is this is the way the world has evolved. And not only that, but people are more willing to believe the market than often the government. So it's char now, as Chris mentioned, there may be abilities for these companies that are financially successful to then have discounted rates for different types of products or customers or clients. But in the end, as my dad would say, you know, you do get what you pay for. The theory of their power is that it's independent, it's private, and that they're generating a business that is sustainable. So that's what you point is the tension. And once whoever is... Well, but then the other issue could become is there is a way of thinking as they mature that certain major customers might say, we're willing to pay for the standard rate. And as part of that in our contract, there's a series of, we think, of organizations that are 501c3s, not-for-profit, that we would like to see them have a discount that we would help subsidize. And that's the way you would be able to generate both a market and 501c3 model. But for us, it's just, that's where the world is moving. And that's having a huge impact on how we understand what accurate and authentic information is. Why don't you take both those questions together? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm Mike Kraft. I worked on um, export control issues. I was in the State Department counterterrorism office for many years. 
And I want to pick up something on page 10 of your report where you talk about trying to deal with uh, dual use items. Uh, one of the problems we found in the counterterrorism area uh, when certain uh, items were allowed for, for Iran, for example, mainly medical items, uh, dual use items, but there was suspicion they might have been used for other purposes. Did you try to deal with the problem of a um, false identification of items? I mean, there's many cases where something was purchased and shipped but under a false identity, describing something that was benign but could be used for, say, testing equipment, etc. And did you try to deal with the um, identifying the end user? Because that was a, always big, a mm -hmm. big problem in mm -hmm. evaluating export controls and, and uh, whether a license should be issued, and which probably gets into the intelligence area. Uh, there's a, the moment we get the other so question, and then yeah. you can answer both of them. Good morning. My name is Erin Dumbacher. I'm with the Scientific and Technical Affairs team at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. I was wondering if um, we could go back to your point about the primacy of governments still in monitoring and verification. Um, my understanding, and I'd be curious of your thoughts on this, is that governments are still very much lacking, including the IC, in incorporating open source data for a variety of reasons, uh, among them bureaucracy, lack of agility to get it quickly, mm -hmm. um, cultural resistance to any data that the IC did not create themselves. So I'd be curious if you would agree with that sort of characterization of the way open source can be integrated into what governments do, and then what sort of, what are the best ways that NGOs or industry even could help to sort of fill that gap? Mm -hmm. So you guys are welcome to answer one of our questions. Let, let me start with with that uh, uh, question, if I, if I might. I think the, the points that you made are, in fact, very valid. There's... Uh, there, there are several challenges for the intelligence community in using open source material, including, you know, the cultural biases. If it was good, we would have collected it and analyzed it uh, uh, first. Uh, but also, increasingly, as we have noted in our studies, there is this problem of the signal to noise uh, uh, problem. And, and in a world where there is a proliferation of fake news and um, uh, information that may, in fact, be introduced by governments into the open source uh, uh, stream as part of their denial and deception efforts to cover up programs, it, it creates um, a, a problem for governments and how do you sort through all this? And that's a little bit the monitoring that goes on behind the double green doors where people are sorting out and the verification judgments that are made out in the public in a variety of ways where you have that competing information playing out in a number of ways. Um, we think to some extent um, the types of, of centers of authentication that we've been talking about actually helps the government by you know, helping a little bit on that signal to noise and reliable information. But uh, I would not be too critical of the government efforts to use open source. Uh, the recent public things by the director of uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency about, you know, m noting the proliferation of multiple sources of information that are relevant about the need for government to ingest the uh, ingest more of that. And it also comes a little bit to the, the point that, that you made, um, not just about funding, but the challenge, and we addressed this a bit and talked about it already in, in, in our report, is in a world where institutions are not trusted, when you have the folks, you know, so I live behind double green doors doing monitoring, and when you come out and say, we looked at this agreement, trust us, it's being complied with, or we looked at this agreement, there is, a, there is a, an issue here. But I can't tell you all the reasons why we think there's an issue here or why we're, we're not concerned. That's why, um, we, one of the reasons why we recommend um, uh, the creation of these external review panels, because then you can put a face to it. You know, it may be that John Lauder, because he lives behind double green doors, when he was in the government, you wouldn't see him out in public talking about this. 
But if you had a review panel that included folks like the late Sid Drell to say, okay, we've looked at this, you've got a face you can put to it, this information, this judgment that's being made about verification is a good one, relying both on the dark arts of sources of methods and open source material. Yeah, just building on that, actually, the one, uh, even on the classified sites I've worked on recently, the one advantage we bring as an NGO community is we can actually go through the open source, we have the time and resources, and then feed it into them in a way that, that's very useful. For so I think it, there's an opportunity for that. Um, can I just, you know, one point on that is, is when I meet with the next generation of folks that are in the government, um, and they'll say things, you know, what was one of your biggest regrets when you were in government, and I can, you know, name a number. <laughs> but one of the things was you don't have time to read. I mean, you're, you're, you're a captive by your inbox. You're captive by the issues of the day. And when I retired from government, I discovered here are all these, these, this incredible volume of literature that was relevant to nonproliferation and arms control and counterterrorism that I was as not familiar with as I should have been in these open source streams because you get, you get overwhelmed by the data. And so you tend to go to the stuff that looks most highly classified first because you don't have the time. Yes, anyone want to answer Mike's question? Sure. So, Mike, for me, the issue that you raise is something that, you know, we're increasingly focused on, I would say, is the concept of the supply chain. And that increasingly we're trying to figure out, both the private sector and the government, how to authenticate the elements of our products to make sure we know and how to track and whether or not at any point in time any of those elements has been manipulated. And I posit to you when we come back together 10 years from now, the level of between cyber uh, electronics and sensors that we're creating in order to create that authenticity for the supply chain is going to make it hard for things to be diverted. And if we use the distributed ledger, increasingly we're going to be under, understanding what the provenance was of a whole range of financial transactions and end use transactions. Now, the, the good side about that is we'll be able to, to have that level of confidence. The downside is it may become increasingly harder for illicit issues like tax evasion, uh, product issues that are um, sort of uh, not, not meeting the standard. And you will not be able to get into the marketplace unless you can have that. And what's interesting about that, the marketplace very much wants it, as do the government. It's only the entities that want to avoid that level of responsibility and accountability that don't want it. So this is going to be a really interesting trend that I would say that you put your finger on, but increasingly it's going to be harder and harder to avoid that level of detection and monitoring across the entire series of issues. John. Can I just say, I'm very grateful for your question. because I think, uh, as Harvey or Chris may have said earlier, um, we're about to enter a, um, a new phase in this project. You know, Hopefully we'll have another funding tranche um, and do some fall-on work. And we're trying to, we're debating among ourselves and with others, the folks that have collaborated with us at the Wisconsin Project that does a lot of the procurement analysis. Is, is there additional things that we could say in an unclassified paper that would be helpful to that world of export controls um, that hasn't been said already? And, yeah. and you know, the, your question kind of leads us to think that Maybe there is something that we should mm -hmm. do. Yeah. What, oh. I want to take a couple more Four. questions. Uh, why don't we take the two young people in the sign, then we'll go to the two experienced people. Uh, why don't we say two, two, two younger people? Yeah, yeah. Younger. yeah okay. so. Hi. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Tyler Swanson with the Osgood Center for International Studies. You guys had touched on North Korea and Iran. Could you possibly go into some detail on the, the role that Russia can play? especially dealing with the th cyber threats and whatnot. And then is there only a role for the NGOs or is there some role for counterintelligence to also help sift through this fake news? And then we, wait, we actually one more question. I want to get right behind you. 
Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Mr. Lauder, you mentioned uh, the issue of um, monitoring and verification and verification judgments, especially mm -hmm. not only made by political actors, but also mm -hmm. by social media and by mm -hmm. the public. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Rishikov, you mentioned the issue of um, authenticity issues of data and um, the reliability of data. So my question is, and I might exaggerate with the wording, but mm -hmm. my question is regarding the weaponization mm -hmm. of information and of data, mm -hmm. especially by social media actors. I mean, we mm -hmm. saw that in the Russian meddling with the U.S. presidential elections. Mm -hmm can that issue or that threat actually go even further to different policy spheres? Thank you. I'll be very quick for, for the Russian question. So I'm involved in a number of cyber related groups and we used to have the United Nations government group of experts, the UNGGE, which I recommend to you, which was involved in trying to create cyber norms for the system. And I would say the problem has become is that the commitment of sovereignty of a number of the players to control their cyberspace and the information that can be brought into the space has been proven to be a different stumbling block in the advancement of these debates. So the issue of what information is going to be allowed to be placed in your area of responsibility, both the Chinese and the Russians have demonstrated they can help lock down that access to information. So we may have a balkanization, and if we move down to the balkanization of what we've known in the Internet, that's going to be a very different world. But that's the issue. So we were saying we all agree that we had the Red Cross, so the Red Cross and, most, um, and the Red Crescent, they're never a lawful target. So we were saying, could we agree that certs, the cyber emergency response teams that are supposed to be able to help bring up a system and take it down, should similarly be like a Red Cross, that you would not ever attack the certs, unclear. Can there be an agreement that in peacetime you never target nuclear facilities and their cyber and their internet relationships and ties? We think so, but it turns out it's unclear if that's going to be a full agreement. And the issue of the weaponization of information, I think, is for us as being one of the most complicated issues that we're encountering. Because I think our adversaries have made it clear they see this as a new space that is extremely effective. It's extremely, it's very uh, cost effective. And how we as a democracy are going to respond to weaponizations of information. We think those centers are one way, a small way to start the process. But it's clear our adversaries have realized that in this new world of social media, this is an unbelievable way to increase our divisiveness by having some token of truth and then going forward with it. So if you look at Hamilton 68, you will see there have been a huge set of blog posts on the FBI. And right now, as you know, the issue of the integrity of the FBI is a big sort of social media question. And it's clear that our adversaries have decided if they can help discredit or cause concern in that area, it will suit their purposes. That's what we're trying to confront in this 21st century. Uh, Really, really, a couple of comments. You um, may identify yourself as sorry. one of the younger people in the room. Thank you. Yes, I'm. No, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> my name is Peter Sharfman. I work at the Mitre Corporation, but the, the foundation of my comments is really that once upon a time, I ran the uh, national security program at the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, and one of the things that OTA had going for it was tremendous uh, uh, barriers against advocacy or the perception or appearance of advocacy. And I want to tell you, it's really hard not to be perceived as an advocate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we were, in fact, not advocating anything, we were nevertheless uh, accused of advocating things. And one of the things that we had trouble with was that it took us a very long time to produce 
good, solid, credible reports. And in fact, these two things are related. Avoiding the perception of advocacy meant going to a lot of trouble to hear multiple sides of a question. And that meant that very often we were not just a few days, but a few years behind the news cycle, which limited uh, our ability to contribute in a, a constructive way to public debate. So the point I'd make as my comment is really that there's a, a, a tension between uh, the desire to be noticed, to contribute, to have an impact on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the fact that credibility sometimes requires taking a lot of time and avoiding advocacy or appearance of advocacy involves taking a lot of trouble and both of these things can detract from the impact. Also, on the subject of the open source, uh, you know, most unclassified government computers are not permitted to access the FAS website. <laughs> uh, it's blocked <laughs> inside the government. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hindrance yeah. to obtaining useful open source information. Uh, the reason, of course, is that the FAS website contains some documents that the government considers to still be classified. And this gets you into a tension between where the government wants the help of outside experts and where the government really passionately wishes that outside experts would butt out, stay away, not get involved, and so forth. And uh, your, your report, which I just skimmed before I went into it, uh, seems to dodge around the question of the incentives that apply to governments as they confront these new sources of information. Yeah, I just say two things. Good to, good to see you again, uh, uh, Peter. You're obviously one of the... Oh, I'm sorry, should the other? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, both Peter and Milt are also long time right. coming yeah. for decades. Milton Honig, International Center for Terrorism Studies. Yeah. Remarkably, uh, we all both have a question on on advocacy, so that's why I want to do that. So two fingers. Okay. Okay. What? Two finger question, go ahead. Yes, of uh, course, you emphasize the remarkable capabilities now of NGOs to collect and analyze data. I mean, it's absolutely incredible, and you've given a very complete discussion of how that's done. And an example is the Wisconsin Project, which you rely on, which does an incredible job. And uh, you can't accuse them of any sort of advocacy, as far as I can see. Uh, but, you know, authentication is part of your center and it's a very important thing. But now I'm concerned in my mind that, uh, specifically in the case of the Iran Agreement, let's say, organizations which have established reputation for analyze, collecting and analyzing data in a dispassionate way, I suddenly get the feeling that they're starting to advocate. And uh, is this something which uh, is, is that you're sensitive to, that organizations which have done remarkable job in collecting data and part of the discussion of the Iran Agreement, or I can name them, but I don't want to. I named one which does a remarkable job in just analyzing data, uh, but um, I, I just have this feeling that uh, maybe I'm oversensitive to this, maybe because it's the people aren't agreeing with my own beliefs, but still I feel there is a, a move, I think I can prove it, uh, towards advocating, and they shouldn't be doing that. They should stick to just hard collection analysis of data. Well, if, if I agree with you, I'm, I'm, uh, it, you're neutral. If I disagree with you, you're an advocate. And I think that's part of the, part of the problem we have in, in, in this world. Uh, on, on the FAS uh, website, or we website issue, access issue, I am told some people do go home and download certain reports and bring them back in on paper. I also note that our former president and uh, major board member hold security clearances. So, little known fact. Let me just, uh, three comments on, on both those very excellent comments and questions. 
Um, one in the Wisconsin project, I'm, it, as Chris had noted earlier, one of the participants in our task force is Valerie Lindsay from the Wisconsin project. I, I'm really sorry she uh, wasn't available today to be part of our panel. I think she's in Paris, which she probably chose wisely. But but she's uh, went. No. But we will. Well, well, well uh, but you know, I think you're right. There's a source of of, of information. I would just say on the the fast uh, comment is that there's actually some wording in the Hudson Institute invitation to this refers to this as a fast task force. And, you know, somebody who still has his clearances and still is polygraphed and Harvey's in the same boat. We're always pains to say this was a task force convened by FAST rather than FAST because it not only is just in terms of going to the website, but um, uh, a government mindset that one needs to worry about FAST because of, of the secrecy project in a very... Harvey, you wanted to add something? Yes, yeah, so I we're know. independent, so we're very uh, sensitive that that we're independent from the actual FAST. But the point you're making, both of you gentlemen, is the issue of the advocacy issue, right? So one of the models we were thinking about is that when you think of, when you want an independent assessment, we used to go to uh, Dun & Bradstreet for a, an evaluation of the company. Or if you want a valuation of commercial paper, we have AAA, AA, and single A vis-a-vis -vis levels of risk. And they're supposed to independently evaluate the risk factors for the financial product. So we were looking for where do you find that in the policy perspective? An independent evaluation, you said the facts. And in the end, the power of the legitimacy of the entity will turn on whether or not it is an honest broker with the facts and issues. So as you said, sir, you're unhappy with an entity that you used to think was doing what it's supposed to do, and now it seems to have tipped over to an advocacy line that you're not happy with. My sense would be that as that happens in the to and fro, we will, the marketplace of ideas, the John Stuart Mill marketplace will say, you are no longer an entity that we are trusting in that way because you stepped over that line and that line is no longer something that we look at that you can look at your analysis as being independent. And so we would hope that the, over time, the different centers of which there'd be multiple and they'd have to communicate with each other independently for a judgment. So that's, and the second issue, the timeliness issue is extremely sensitive. So if you wanna play in the game, you have to be able to be in those news cycles. So we're saying there's some facts and issues that will be able to be in the news cycle and some that will take longer. I don't think we need to have years, but we need to have a period of time for them to say, this is a problem and we've had a problem with how this information was generated. We can tell you right now these three assertions are factually incorrect. And so that should give you some sense about the full story. And we're gonna do a deeper dive over the next month or two months, depending on the resources, to get a fuller uh, leverage on the issue. But we, I think we all would agree, we need some mechanism that we can feel comfortable with that is gonna give us leverage and perspective on what's going on in these information cycles. Let me just do a two finger cut on this very important point of advocacy. One of the reasons that we're, we are at such pains to make that distinction between monitoring and verification, as, as you both know, that when the intelligence community and others that are involved in the monitoring process testify before Congress, and I spent a lot of time doing that on a variety of arms control agreements, our credibility rested on coming forward with the types of reports that you referred to, Peter, is here is our compilation of information that's relevant to compliance judgments about this agreement. Um, we're not taking a position about what that political verification judgment should be or about whether you should ratify this agreement. But we're bringing you our best expertise assessment about what we can detect and what we can't detect and now you know, which open scores plays a, a, an important role. And I've, I've 
and I think for some of us that now are on the outside, um, there there isn't a week that goes by that I don't get an email from a, a think tank or a political advocacy group and said, would you sign this letter going to the Hill, you know, for or against some aspect of arms control and nonproliferation policy? And it's a personal preference. I, I have not signed those letters because I think it would diminish my credibility as somebody who could speak about monitoring to be an advocate for a particular group. And you mentioned, Harvey mentioned timeliness, and unfortunately we've run out of time <laughs> for our own event. Sure. There were a couple more hands, though. So uh, if it's just a, a short question, comment, why don't you just say it, and, but we'll, and we'll think about it as, as we depart. I think at least you had a, a question or comment. And if anybody else wants to make a parting comment. Sure, just a quick remark. I think an example of the technical expertise in academia being brought to bear on this is in the seismic domain where I think their seismologists have played a strong role mm -hmm. in the analysis of public domain data to supplement government efforts. And I think the question at hand here is, what other information sources are there where technical expertise in academia can be brought to bear in a constructive way? It's a perfect, a perfect example that, was there a testing? Well, this group has said the Earth moved this level. Something happened. We can say what it is, but you guys would say something happened. Exactly. In the law, we say it's a res ipsa locator. The thing speaks for itself. So if you're walking down the street and an anvil falls on your head, we know someone is liable. The question is who? Spoken like a true uh, lawyer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, please uh, join me in thanking our, our speakers, and I look forward to seeing you guys at our next event. <laughs>